Okay, so as our speaker is um, trying to log on and will log on every time, any time from now, I would like to take this opportunity yet again to invite you to the, this very exciting day of lung science. Uh, once again, I'm Patricia Lupo, your moderator for today. I'm a physician and research fellow at the, at the Lung Institute. And today we are going to have a very interesting and engaging um, day of lung science discussion where we are looking at the linkages between climate change and respiratory health. And we are going to have very um, seasoned speakers on this subject. Our first speaker is uh, the chairperson of the Uganda Meteorological uh, Association. And he's going to give us an oversight concerning the trends that we are seeing in regard to climate change. And then we'll have uh, the clinical linkage made by a physician, Dr. Chimuli Ivan, who is a physician at the Lung Institute and also the head of clinical services. So as we look forward to these, uh, please uh, register your names and your institutions in the inbox, in the chat. And also as the discussions go on, we are going to have a time that is allocated purely for Q&A. So you can keep your questions for that time or keep uh, putting them in the inbox as the discussions go on. Okay, um, it seems our speaker is still having challenges, the first speaker as we had planned and intended for him to speak first, but as we wait for him to join on and in the interest of time, we could have um, the discussion go in reverse and then we shall link the two 
whenever the second speaker comes on. So Dr. Chimuli Ivan will be starting us off by giving us the linkages of climate change to respiratory health. And as he prepares to do so, maybe I'll just give us a background concerning um, what it is and the challenge that we are facing with the climate change. As you may be aware, there has been a lot of evidence concerning the effect of climate change on many aspects beyond just our health. We have seen it on the farming industry. We've seen um, droughts. We've seen it affect um, nutrition on many fronts and health overall, cardiovascular, respiratory, and the linkages are a bit intricate given there's a lot that is affected that comes into play when we talk about climate change. There's food that changes, the air changes, the water levels change, and trying to tease out the effect of climate change per se on a particular system in health is not very straightforward. And this is where we come in trying to tease out the interplay between the two. And um, the physician today, Dr. Chimule, is going to help us elucidate on that and help us appreciate the impact this is having on lung health in particular and where we come in at play in this regard. Ivan, you're very welcome. Um, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Kaloku. I hope I hope I can be heard. Yes, you're loud and clear. Okay. Greetings to uh, the little one out there. So, colleagues, good afternoon. I um. Like I've been introduced, my name is uh, Ivan Chimudi, and uh, today we had wanted to share something that is uh, topical, which is basically climate change. Uh, uh, we know that there's a lot that is going on in our in the world. Actually, it's not only in our country, but it's a global issue, and uh, we had wanted to. To, to pick some information from what is happening in uh, the country. We know that we are collecting information on a regular basis uh, by, different, uh, by different entities. Uh, the Lung Institute is a strong partner in, uh, in, um, in the interests of the country when it gets to uh, the environment. And we do have uh, an air pollution an air quality and environmental health group that is pertinent, that is really interested in uh, looking out for opportunities to make a difference uh, when it gets to when it gets to um, uh, uh, the, the, the environment around us. Um, today we had partnered with the the, the, the national the Uganda National Meteorological Authority. So that they can give us what they have been seeing over the past. Most of the data that we see in, in literature is usually uh, data that is coming in from uh, uh, out of Uganda, but we are glad uh, we are glad that we are able to to get some information that is uh, from within uh, Uganda itself. Hopefully, um, our colleague can join us. And then later on, we shall be able to uh, share that information. So let me start off with my part of the presentation. So I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so I'll I'll try to 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 discuss um, the relationship between climate change and health, and hopefully by the end of uh, this presentation we'll have understood the linkages and the implications of climate change and health. So. As a way of introduction, um, climate change is really 
a term that is, is simply talking about the long-term shifts in the temperatures, uh, the weather patterns as per United Nations description of climate change. Um, and uh, it has been described as one of the defining challenges of our time by uh, different scholars. Um, you will notice that many of the, the meetings that have talked about clim climate change have highlighted the fact that global temperatures are rising, uh, weather patterns are becoming more erratic, and uh, uh, approximately 7 million premature deaths are reported annually, and this is in a report by WHO, and a significant proportion of this uh, is attributed to respiratory disease. Um, therefore, understanding and addressing the impacts of climate change uh, on respiratory health is not only a matter of public health, but a call to action for literally everybody that is responsible. Uh, policymakers, healthcare professionals, society or the community, as you may call it, uh, so that we have um, a significant uh, a change uh, or diversion of the trajectory as it is now. So if you were to be as general as possible, Climate change is going to impact human health from various uh, aspects. And uh, what has been observed is uh, the rising temperatures. Uh, and these temperatures have actually led to very extreme weather. So heat waves in some places, uh, wildfires in some places, but what else has been observed is the rising sea levels. And uh, this together goes with the increasing carbon dioxide levels. So the carbon dioxide levels, the carbon dioxide levels, uh, carbon, dioxide, carbon dioxide is one of the greenhouse gases. And uh, these gases uh, basically, because we are producing a lot of these gases, they are like a blanket, so they go uh, up in the atmosphere and actually form a blanket on, 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 on the earth. And uh, we don't have heat that is ex escaping from the earth as it was. So in the process, we are getting global warming. And this global warming is uh, altering quite a number of weather patterns. Uh, and uh, in the process of altering other patterns, you are going to find quite a number of things happening. For example, uh, air pollution is going to uh, change or that is going to increase. Then we are going to have changes in the vector ecology. Uh, you have noticed that in some places malaria has increased, yet it never used to be. Right now we have an epidemic of malaria that was uh, declared and is being uh, addressed by the Ministry of Health in Eastern Uganda. Uh, we have uh, increasing allergens. Uh, the water quality is also going to be altered. Uh, so this is going to impact significantly on waterborne diseases, uh, malnutrition, diarrhea diseases, uh, Environmental degradation is going to lead to forced migration, civil conflict, and the unseen NCDs of mental health. Uh, and then we also have the heat-related heat illnesses and death, as well as cardiovascular failure. Uh, we are going to have injuries, uh, fatalities, um, and this is also going to further impact on the mental health. So uh, as, as, as a way of really looking at this, um, it's not only the air that we breathe in, but there are quite a number of things that are going to be affected uh, or that are going to impact on human health as we, uh, we alter the 
the, the climate that we have. So if we specifically look at um, if we specifically look at uh, at, at uh, heat as a result of climate change, you will particularly see that it has both indirect and direct effects uh, on human health. So the WHO has actually warned that uh, uh, climate change uh, is is is. Uh, it's potentially the greatest threat that we have for the 21st century because of these uh, altered weather patterns and uh, the temperatures are definitely uh, an issue because sometimes you may not even realize that this effect is because of uh, increased temperature. So if we look at the direct effects in particular, we have the heat related illnesses then you're going to have accelerated deaths from uh, respiratory diseases and uh, cardiovascular disease, as well as increased hospitalization from uh, consequences of uh, uh, having high temperatures. So during more frequent health, more frequent uh, heat waves, uh, people are going to be at risk of uh, uh, heat related uh, illnesses like heat strokes, uh, exacerbations of uh, chronic illnesses that were previously uh, prevalent, the cardiovascular diseases and the respiratory diseases. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we are going to risk uh, environmental damage. Uh, things like forest fires, dust storms, which uh, ultimately are going to uh, affect uh, the human health. Um, they, there have been reports that with prolonged dry seasons, with dry seasons uh, uh, being more prevalent than before, there is going to be prolonged exposure to uh, pollen, and this is going to promote uh, uh, exacerbation of uh, hypersensitivity diseases like asthma and COPD that are going to affect uh, uh, the respiratory systems uh, or respiratory health of individuals. So potential disruption in infrastructure, power is going to be disrupted, or we are going to demand a little more of the power because of the heat. People are going to use power in order to cool their environments. Uh, water levels are going to change. Transport is going to be affected and productivity, uh, both uh, from uh, agriculture and elsewhere in industry is also going to be affected, which will in the, in the, in the end affect uh, how the human health is, uh, is, is going to be uh, constructed. Um, yes, uh, they, they, there's a relationship with the accidents, uh, there's a relationship with injuries, poisonings, and of course, uh, the mental health bit of it where uh, um, people are going to, to be distressed and probably maladapt. Uh, of course, the impact on health service delivery is going to be part of this. Uh, because of increased heat, ambulance callouts may be many, and yet the response is going to be slower. And then you will have uh, effects on the storage of medicines uh, as it is uh, probably may require more use of uh, electricity or other sources of fuel to try and cool uh, where the, uh, the drugs are being stored. So uh, it, all in all, it uh, looks like um, the impacts of uh, um, extreme heat as a result of climate change and health seem to be varied and coming from uh, various uh, various facets. So in, if we zero in on uh, respiratory health, so when we talk about respiratory health, we are talking about uh, that well-being and proper functioning of the respiratory system and uh, the organs which are part of the respiratory system therein are part and parcel. Uh, 
uh, it plays a crucial role in maintaining overall health. As you know, without oxygen, uh, health is impaired, the quality of life is impaired. So the respiratory system allows us to breathe in, expel carbon dioxide, and the various uh, parts, uh, organs that are part of the respiratory system, uh, an intricate network of the airways uh, that leads down to the lungs. So um, I wanted to um, highlight uh, the relationship that exists between climate change and respiratory health. And uh, we shall be a little bit slow here because uh, I think this is where most of the discussion should be held. So climate change has been observed to contribute to increased levels of air pollution. And um, as we all know, uh, this has significant implications for respiratory health. Um, so rising temperatures uh, uh, and changes in the precipitation patterns uh, that have been observed um, can lead to formation of, uh, of ozone, especially the ground level ozone uh, and fine particulate matter. So we'll have a slide that is talking about uh, particulate matter. And ozone and particulate matter are, have been found to be quite harmful to the respiratory health. And uh, studies have actually shown that long-term exposure to air pollution is associated with development and worsening of respiratory conditions, uh, including asthma, COPD, and respiratory infections. Um, the quality of air that you breathe in has a significant impact on your lungs. And so if you breathe in air that is full of allergens, uh, that is pollen and molds, uh, which has definitely been an influence uh, or have been influenced by uh, climate change, uh, one of the things that uh, seem to be prevalent in our settings if you enter people's houses, uh, you're going to find people's paints actually peeling off the houses. Uh, it has been blamed on the materials that we are using to construct our houses. Uh, but uh, uh, th there's also, there's also, um, there's also uh, a possibility that because of climate change, we are unable to uh, control the mold that is coming into our constructions. So rising temperatures, altered precipitation patterns are going to affect uh, the growth and pollution cycles of plants, uh, leading to extended pollen seasons and higher concentrations of pollen. And uh, this is definitely going to impact on uh, the, the, the patients, especially those that are susceptible. Um, the extreme weather events, uh, extreme cold, extreme heat, um, have also been uh, uh, have also been observed to lead to um, heat waves, wildfires, uh, hurricanes, as natural disasters, storms, and this can directly impact on respiratory health by exacerbating respiratory conditions and increasing the risk of heat-related illnesses. Um, I think the, 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 the mechanisms that uh, we see here highlight the interconnectedness between climate change and respiratory health, meaning that if we are to, to tackle one uh, or to get uh, a result uh, that is beneficial to the human health, we need to tackle each of these not only tackle one. The concept of particulate matter and respiratory health is uh, something that we have known for quite some time now. Uh, particulate matter refers to a mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets that are suspended in the air. 
and it's uh, it could be primary or it could be secondary. That that is primary is uh, emitted from uh, various sources, including combustion. But there is that that is formed as uh, 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 as a reaction uh, through uh, chemical reactions that are involving precursor gases like sulfur dioxide. So depending on the aerodynamic di diameter of uh, particulate matter that is formed, you could have different sizes uh, of uh, the particulate matter. And these are going to penetrate deeper into the lungs depending on the size that they are. Uh, exposure to PM uh, is associated with a range of adverse health effects uh, particularly on the respiratory system, but also on other systems like the cardiovascular system. Um, so the, the, the effects that have been observed on the respiratory system could be short-term effects uh, like irritation of the airways, uh, which is going to present with uh, symptoms like uh, wheezing, coughing, and shortness of breath. And then we also have aggravation of existing respiratory condition. So patients with asthma, COPD, are going to present with worsened symptoms. But we also have long-term effects where we have development or exacerbation uh, of uh, uh, chronic respiratory diseases like uh, COPD. And then we also have uh, generally observed uh, reduction in lung function. So people have been observed that with prolonged exposure to PM, uh, one can lead to reduced, fun one can develop reduced lung function, impaired growth of lungs in children. And for those whose decline of uh, the lungs was under physiological uh, conditions, this can actually be accelerated with exposure to uh, particulate matter. So the health effects of uh, PM are largely going to depend on various factors, but uh, these are going to include um, uh, the size of the particles, what is the composition of the particles, if they are toxic substances, uh, duration of exposure, the longer you expose to um, PM 2.5, the more the likelihood of uh, being uh, developing uh, health effects and of course uh, individual susceptibility uh, that is innate as we all know. Then we have the concept of ozone. So ozone as we all know is uh, not meant to be at uh, ground level but uh, formation of ground level ozone has been observed uh, and this is not something that is emitted directly into the atmosphere, but because of complex chemical reactions that are involving the sunlight, um, nitrogen oxides, or the NOx, the volatile organic compounds, and other pollutants uh, in the environment. Um, these gases, uh, like the nitrogen oxides and uh, VOCs, are emitted by various sources, which we are all uh, culpable of. So vehicles that we use, power plants, industrial processes, uh, chemical solvents, and uh, these uh, are basically uh, mixed with the, uh, in, in the setting of high temperatures and the sunlight, the chemical reactions transform these precursor pollutants into ground level ozone. Um, the, 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 the observation is that uh, ozone formation, ground level ozone formation is more prevalent in urban and, industri and industrial areas as would be expected because of, uh, because of the industries there. Uh, but uh, in rural areas, people are slightly more protected from uh, formation of ground level ozone. So ozone formation, um, uh, can actually lead to exacerbation of uh, various conditions. Uh, as uh, you may uh, suspect, uh, asthma exacerbations uh, are going to be higher in patients who are uh, exposed to uh, ground level ozone. Uh, we are going to have reduced lung function, 
because the exposure can temporarily reduce lung function, making it harder to breathe and decreasing the ability of the lungs to actually take in oxygen. But the other observation is uh, ground level also increasing uh, the likelihood of getting respiratory tract infections uh, because the ozone exposure weakens uh, the respiratory immune system, making someone uh, uh, prone to uh, infections, uh, bronchitis, pneumonias, as we uh, can as we can always imagine. But we also have long-term effects. So exposure to ozone for a long time can actually be associated with development and uh, progression of the chronic respiratory diseases. Uh, and uh, uh, this may actually, in children, uh, lead to development of asthma. So uh, the severity of the health impacts of ozone uh, are definitely going to depend on the concentration and the duration of exposure, individual susceptibility, and if somebody has uh, underlying conditions, uh, that, that are underlying respiratory conditions that could potentially be worsened by the exposure to ozone. Uh, the extreme weather events that have been observed during uh, this uh, 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 climate change uh, phase of the, of the Earth have a significant contribution to lung health or respiratory health. And uh, we cannot uh, say indeed that none of us has experienced uh, any of this. In Uganda, we have seen, uh, we have had times where the heat has actually been quite uh, temperatures have actually shot. Uh, they, 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 if uh, Mr. Omoni joins the group, the team, you are going to see that the over between 1975 and uh, 2000, 2011, 2020, 2021, there has been an increase of uh, the daily, the mean daily temperatures by about by about two degrees centigrade. So this is something that is a bit scary uh, for us. And uh, so heat waves uh, um, are going to impact uh, on respiratory health and uh, they are going to lead to admissions for respiratory tract infections, heat related exacerbations of asthma and other lung conditions. Uh, they, team at the GeoHub Health, uh, uh, which uh, I think Professor Lina Tuyambe is part, have actually observed a correlation uh, with the um, admissions in hospitals, uh, looking at two factors, looking at uh, air pollution in particular, but also if you map this against uh, what we have in the rises of the daily mean temperatures, uh, there, has, there is a correlation between admissions and the heat waves uh, that have uh, been captured in the weather, on the weather stations. Wildfires are not very common here, but uh, wildfires have been uh, observed in quite a number of places uh, where we have a release of harmful pollutants, including PM2.5, VOCs, and other toxic gases uh, that could potentially uh, exacerbate uh, uh, potentially exacerbate respiratory symptoms, uh, especially if you have a pre-existing respiratory condition. Um, hurricanes and floods. So we have seen a number of flooding situations in Uganda for various reasons. Uh, I think uh, because of our degradation, we have blocked uh, how um, water flows. But on the other hand, we have had actually heavy downpours that have uh, displaced, uh, damaged infrastructure. Um, this has also led to increased mold growth uh, due to flooding. And uh, some of the 
some of the conditions that patients are presenting with are related to these uh, um, these, these uh, uh, outcomes from these floods that we have seen in Uganda. Uh, so, in a pro, in a way, uh, this uh, in, increases uh, the indoor air pollutants, and uh, this also goes with poor sanitation, uh, overcrowding, as well as limited access to healthcare facilities during and after these floods, and this can exacerbate respiratory health risks that have been uh, uh, that have been uh, reported by some of the of the scholars so these extreme weather events pose significant challenges to respiratory health and require appropriate preparedness and response and mitigation strategies so what are some of the mitigation strategies that we can use and subsequently protect respiratory health we have missed the first presentation but uh, we all appreciate that climate change is primarily a product of the greenhouse gases largely a product of greenhouse gases so if we make attempts to reduce uh, the concentration of uh, greenhouse gases or greenhouse emissions we are going to have a positive impact on a number of things, including respiratory health. So some of these things, as you may notice, are not, uh, some of the mitigation strategies are not a strategy that we uh, are going to employ as individuals. Uh, they will require, uh, they are going to require, they are going to require policy directions they are going to require quite a number of uh, uh, um, industrial, industrial, uh, industrial changes, but there is something that at individual level we can do. So, uh, transitioning to clean gases or to clean energy, rather, uh, because we know that uh, most of the greenhouse gases are coming in because of using fossil fuels. Uh, so. Uh, 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 and, and activism, not maybe not not activism, but a move to to, to using clean energy, uh, that is electricity, LPG, uh, solar energy, is going to significantly lead to a reduction in how much uh, greenhouses greenhouse gases we actually form. Uh, energy efficiency, implementing energy efficiency measures in buildings, uh, transportation, uh, industries, because these are the large uh, producers of the greenhouse gases, uh, in a way, reducing energy consumption, and they are subsequently reducing the emissions, lowering the emissions. Um, sustainable transportation. Uh, if uh, we could promote public transportation vis-a-vis people getting on into their cars and moving, driving. Uh, yesterday I stayed in the traffic for one and a half hours just from Janja. So uh, if we could reduce uh, uh, this driving and therefore reduce all the emissions, encourage walking, encourage cycling. Uh, electric vehicles of course are not ours for now, but I know there are some people that could afford them. This is potentially going to reduce vehicle emissions. Uh, and subsequently, it's going to improve air quality and reduce the respiratory health risks that are linked to traffic-related pollution. The other uh, mitigation strategy is really looking at uh, uh, improving air quality through regulations and policies. Um, if we are to strengthen air quality regulations, and implement effective policies, we are going to uh, significantly reduce the quality or rather the, the amount of uh, uh, emissions that we have. Uh, Kampala Capital City Authority has an action plan uh, that uh, it launched 
uh, we think if we have emission standards and implementing and enforcing stricter emission standards for industrial facilities in particular, uh, power plants, vehicles, and other pollution sources, the colleagues on this uh, of the air pollution group, uh, and I am not afraid to say this, will tell you that uh, there are standards that have been put in place for uh, the emissions that are supposed to come from the industrial facilities. But if you looked around, if you went around the industry, you are going to find that some of these standards, most of the industries actually are not upholding these standards. You are going to struggle to find their monitoring data that is looking at uh, how much they are, they are emitting. Um, so in a way, we do not know how much we are actually emitting but we know that it is way, way above what the emission standards require. So enforcing or strengthening air quality regulations and implementing these effectively is, is quite important. Um, we also know that uh, there are quite a number of uh, uh, um, people that are exposed to indoor air pollution. So the indoor air quality also needs to have guidelines that are implemented and regulations for indoor air quality in buildings, uh, including schools and healthcare facilities, would go a long way in reducing exposure to indoor pollutants and therefore subsequently improve respiratory health. So as I wind up, I want to say that these mitigation strategies are not going to be handled uh, by an individual, but they require collaborative efforts among quite a number of stakeholders, governments, policymakers, industry, healthcare professionals, and individuals to achieve significant improvement in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in respiratory health. Um, so how do we uh, try to get um, these uh, strategies uh, out of the way. So we need to adapt as uh, as as as, uh, uh, as 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 a community and have and build resilience to some of the catastrophes that can actually uh, be apparent when. Uh, when we, we do not uh, abide by the, by the regulations. So uh, 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 one of the things that I probably would want to say is enhancing early warning symptoms, or early warning systems rather. So enhancing early warning systems uh, will help us in uh, monitoring and forecasting, which is something that was uh, going to be spoken to by my colleague. Um, because this is what uh, they stand for. Uh, so monitoring and forecasting and implementing robust monitoring systems that are going to track air quality and uh, ensuring that there are timely alerts and communications that are made to uh, the community of an impending health hazard, such as an extreme heat event, uh, poor air quality, and uh, pollen outbreaks. Uh, there are figures uh, for air pollution uh, in, uh, in, 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 in during COVID, and uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get that figure here. But you would see how quiet that the, 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 the air was during COVID. Uh, public education and awareness uh, is is key uh, by the authorities to ensure that we are building resilience and uh, uh, ensuring that campaigns are made to raise awareness about the danger of climate change on uh, uh, respiratory health. So Chair, I want to stop here. I don't know if my colleague has joined, but I wanted to pick just a few slides from his presentation, which I will project if he has not yet joined. 
uh, I submit sharing. Thank you, Ivan, for the very elaborative and, and educative talk that you have given us. I believe from it, we've, we've been able to appreciate the intricacies that are, are involved in this whole cascade and um, interplay between the climate change and health, particularly respiratory. The colleague presenter has not yet been able to join in. And I think if there are any aspects of this presentation that you think you can go Hello, I'm already in. Okay, great. You're very welcome, Mr. George. Thank you. Thank yes. you. As I'd introduced him earlier. Mr. George is um, a climate scientist from uh, the Metro National Meteorological Authority, and he's going to help us uh, tie that to Dr. Chikuli had talked about uh, the, the global scene and climate change, and which we are also seeing locally and in Uganda as a country. And uh, he's best place to help us appreciate this and, and see how the patterns link to what we are seeing now. Mr. George, you're welcome. You can start your presentation. Thank you. Way. Thank you for welcoming you for this meeting. Sorry, I had a very big problem with uh, the connectivity of the network. But finally, at least I managed to join. Uh, I'm traveling, but I'm going to have a brief stop. Then I will have to make my presentation. So kindly, if possible, you can share my presentation on the slide. As had been introduced um, by the name George William. Uh, I work with the Uganda National Meteorological Authority. So what I'm going to present will be majorly on the climate change and the climate variability, where we'll take a look at the changes within the globe, the Africa and Uganda, then an hour to that. So I request to project my slide so that I can go through. Thank you. Okay, Patricia, can I project? Or are you projecting? No, please project. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the first slide you can see that's my name, the institution. I will start with the, the second slide. Uh, can you go to the next slide? George, are you able to see what I'm projecting? Yeah, go to next slide. I'm seeing it. He's requesting you to move to the next slide. Okay. So can you see that? No. Yeah, I'm seeing that. Can, can you put it in a presentation mode? Oh, you are not seeing what I am. I'm seeing, uh, but uh, I try to put it in the presentation mode. Sorry, let me stop share. Mm. I thought I was sharing. Okay, I think there are two slides that are. Was... So I've moved ahead. Can can you can? You, are you seeing what I'm projecting okay. now? Yeah, yes, I'm that's... seeing now. Okay, thank you. Um, now 
I go through the first, the second slide. Now this second slide majorly, I brought it forward so that it give us a clear distinction between climate, climate change, climate variability and weather. Because these four things, people always mix them a lot. They can be talking about one when they're meaning the other one. So I start with the weather. The weather is just a meteorological phenomena that appears in the short time possible. And it is something that you can see, you can feel by your skin. So that is what we refer to as the weather. But when we talk of the climate, majorly we refer to the long-term statistic of these weather elements. We have seven weather elements, the rainfall, the temperature. So that is we look at the average of that particular weather element over a longer period of time. When we talk about the longer period of time, we look at the uh, average. And the longer period should be not less than something like 30 years. So here, there, we will be talking of the climate of the place. And the climate, if we are to describe, it will be how cold, how warm the place is. So there we'll be describing the climate. Then we come to the aspect of the change in the climate. Whenever we are talking about the change of the climate, it means there is a systematic change for a longer period of time. And this one must be consistent and it must be systematic, like period of 10 years, where if you talk about the rainfall, the rainfall must be declining for a period of 10 years nonstop. Then if it happens in less than 10 years, like on a yearly basis, there we always refer to variation. So that one is a climatic variation. So that is the kind of distinction that we need to always make when we refer to something like a climate change, a climate variation, or uh, a climate itself and the weather. So variation can happen on the monthly basis, can also happen on a yearly basis. For example, like if we have a lot of rainfall in January this year, but next year we don't see that kind of rainfall coming the way it happened this year. So we refer to that kind of climatic variation. Next slide. So in distinguishing these two uh, factors, we look at the time scale intervals at which it occurs, then the area. For a climate, it must be over a wider area, not a localized place. So that is the two distinguishing features that is always taken when we are describing the climate. Next. Now, what are the causes of the global climate change? There are two causes of the changes. There is natural changes, natural causes, and there is man-made. When we talk about the natural changes, we can talk of the oceans. The ocean is by itself changing. The land by itself is changing. The volcanic activity also changing. Solar radiation, the one we receive from the sun is also changing. Then the natural variability. All these are happen by nature and we, have, we don't have any control over it. But if they are happening alone, they would not be having like a serious effect on what we might be feeling right now. But now we have gone deeper to do more, to increase or to amplify the amplitude of these particular changes. And what have we done? That is the man-made urbanization. You know, urbanization comes with a lot of demands and this demand put a lot of pressure on the, na on the natural environment. The land use pattern, how we are using the land, it is now causing even more changes of the climate because we are increasing the changes which are already done naturally. Aerosols, those are tiny particles which are always uh, emitted into the atmosphere. And majorly it comes from industries. So this one, they are also the cause of the climate change. Then the greenhouse gas. The greenhouse gas, I will talk more about it in the next slide. Go next. Now, in this global climate change, the major one, we are going to talk about the greenhouse gas. Now, this greenhouse gas come from what is called the human induced. 
So this human induced, it is coming from things like always we do the burning of the fossil fuels, charcoal and charcoal uh, clearing land for agriculture, deforestation through lumbering, human settlement, agronomic practice. Uh, by doing all this, it means that the earth is not keeping the natural cycle of its dynamic. Then at the end, it will be changing beyond what it is expected. And the end effect is always on the livelihood of the community. So what does it imply in these greenhouse gases? And what are the causes of this global climate change, the major? Greenhouse gas, these are gases which are found in the atmosphere and they can absorb the solar radiation, which is emitted back into space. That is the long wave, uh, long wave, uh, long wave radiation. You know, when the solar radiation is coming from the sun, it is coming in form of a short wave radiation. Then as it is coming, some of the component will be absorbed by these particles which are found in the atmosphere. Other uh, component will be reflected back to space. Then other component will be entering the what? The earth surface. Now, on arrive on being absorbed by the earth surface, it will be uh, going back into space in form of a long wave radiation. Now, this long wave radiation, when it is going back to space, if there is nothing that can trap it back, it means it will cool the surface of the earth. But because of the presence of these greenhouse gases, then these greenhouse gases will re-radiate this long wave radiation back into, into the space. And that is the reason why we normally find there is warming of the earth's surface. And some of these greenhouse gases are the carbon dioxide gas, the methane, halocarbon, and some of these gases. The, 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 now we find these gases, the increase in the concentration of these gases in the atmosphere is directly proportional to the increase in the temperature of the earth. Meaning they are present on, or in the atmosphere is very important because it will really keep us alive. If it is to be removed completely from the atmosphere, automatically we will not survive on this particular planet. So their presence is okay, but their, in, their concentration should not be increased so that we can survive very well. So it should be noted that these greenhouse gases absorb the heat radiated from the earth surface and it is re reflected back onto the earth surface, which at the end will result into the global climate change. Next. Next slide. Go to next slide. Next slide, Ivan. Hold on, just give me a second. I don't know what I what I have done. Click again. It has not yet gone to the next slide. Aha. Now, let's look at the driver of the climate change. I stated earlier the solar radiation, which is coming from the sun. You can see when it is coming, then within the atmosphere, there are so many components. We have the aerosols, we have the cloud, we have the ozone and others. So this solar radiation, when it is coming, the amount which is emitted from the sun, it is not the same like the one which is reaching the earth's surface. You can see absorption is also taking place in the atmosphere. Uh, reflection reflected back into space is also taking place by some of these gases. Then some of the component which is reaching the earth's surface, some component will be absorbed by the earth's surface. Then other component will be reflected back. Now this one which is reflected back goes back to the atmosphere in form of a long wave radiation. 
So as it is going back to space, it will get these greenhouse gases. If it is, there is too much concentration of that, then these greenhouse gases will re reflect them back onto the Earth's surface. Definitely, it is the indication of the warming of the planet. Next. Now, what drives the climate change? The main driver of the climate change, number one, is the population increase. You know, population increase comes with a lot of demands for food and settlement, giving a lot of pressure on the natural environment. And at the end, there is a change of the climate system. Number two, increased demand for energy, factories, biomass, transport, and so on. Because people need a lot of this manufactured good, then at the end, we end up going and crouching into this uh, environment. We are not spared whether it is uh, developed countries, whether it is developing countries, whatever they are doing, the impact will be global. Economic factors like charcoal burning, bricks burning is also not spared. Those are also contributor of the climate change. They drive the climate change because by doing those kind of activities, it means that we are encroaching onto the natural environment. Then they, we know also the world production of minerals and manufactured products is growing steadily. That's where developed countries are so much investing in it. And by doing that, they are putting a lot of pressure in the atmosphere. If you see the kind of factories, the, the smoke which is coming from the factories goes to the atmosphere. These are the major sources of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And it will not affect only their country. The effect will be worldwide. Next. Now, what are some of the evidence? of this climate change. If you look at this graph, you can see the fluctuation, the first one on the top, that is on the left, that is the fluctuation of Lake Victoria from 18 something. You can see it was fluctuating within a mean up to some years, like around 19 uh, oh. Thereafter, the level went up when the level went up, then again, it started declining steadily. So that steady decline, if you look at it, the last portion of the graph, it is a clear indication of the changes of the climate, which is being impacted on it. And for the shorter period of time, you can now see how the lake levels is, de is decreasing. So that decrease of the lake's level, it is a clear, indication that we can account it to the change of the climate system, which is doing that. And what is bringing that? Majorly from developed countries and also what we do locally within the country. Now, let us look at Lake Chad, which is in Central Africa. In 1963, you can see the area coverage. Then after 10 years, 1973, you can see it has started reducing. Then after another 10 years, that is 1987, you can see where it is going. And now 1997, you can see how the area coverage is moving. Then in 2001, just look by yourself. Currently, I don't know where it is, so if we look at this right from 1963 up to 2001, you can see the area coverage is reducing. That is a clear indicator of climate change. Next. Let's look at the ice cap on Mount Kilimanjaro. 1930, you can see the area coverage was too big. Then 1970, started reducing. Then now, that is uh, 2000, you can see where it is, and 2001. 
So if you see just a drastic drop from 1900 up to 2020, you can now see that there is a very clear line that the ice coverage on Mount Kilimanjaro is definitely decreasing. What brings that? Definitely we can conclude that is the increase in temperature of the globe. And this increase in temperature is coming from the high concentration of the greenhouse gases, the one we are emitting into the atmosphere, which is bringing the melting of the ice cap on Mount Kilimanjaro. It is not only Mount Kilimanjaro, even we have our mountain, Mount Renzori, the ice coverage is also reducing. So all those, because the temperature of the earth is warming time after time. Next. So if we come to Uganda, what are some of the evidence of uh, the climate change? Number one, we talk of the increased malaria incidences in the colder and highlands region due to global warming. All of us, I believe we know a place like Kabale, which is in the southwestern Uganda, used to be called malaria free zone. Right now, there are mosquitoes in those areas. Why there is mosquito? Because the place is now warming. It was not as cold as it used to be, where, where mosquito could not survive. So that is the indication that the climate of the place has already changed. Mount Renzori, ice cap reducing. Then increased occurrence or and severity of extreme weather events. If you look nowadays, flood, drought, prolonged dry spell are so frequent compared to the past. So this frequency of occurrence of this extreme weather event are tied to the climate change incidences. We did an analysis of looking at the drought occurring between 1991 to 2000 over Uganda. You can see uh, we are very much interested in 1991 to 2000. So from 1911 to 1920, drought occurring was only once in Uganda. Then 1921 to 1930, there was nothing. 1931, 1940, it occurs only one. Then 41, 50, nothing. 51, 60, one time. 61, 70, nothing. 71, 80, it went almost up to uh, three times. Then come to 91, 2000, seven times. So if you are to draw the best line of fit for this particular graph, you can see there is a serious increase in occurrence of the drought. What does it imply? Climate change is the cause of all that. Next. Now, let us look at this. This is the rainfall performance for Uganda for, for the different seasons. The map number one at the top is for the season of September, October, November. You can now see the green area, meaning there is an increase in rainfall during September, October, November. But I will tell you the confidence level of uh, what had been observed in the upper one. So you can see uh, the confidence level, like in northern, some part of northern Uganda and around Lake Chioga, it says there is an increase in rainfall during September, October, November. But uh, that one is for March, April, and May rainfall, telling us that March, April, and May rainfall is increasing over the central northern, while for September, October, November, there is an increasing rainfall in the greater eastern part of Uganda and some part of uh, the lake region. Then go to the next slide, which tells you about the significance of this particular increase. There is that one slide which was missing because it was telling us about the significance of the, what we have observed. So if you look at the March, April and May, you will find 
that kind of increase, which was spelled by uh, that particular data, it was not really a confident yes. If you look at the, 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 okay, look at that red area for March, April, and May. So the red area meaning decrease, the green area meaning increase. So if you look at the red area for March, April, and May, then you the next there is a very significant shows that the greater eastern sector there is increase in rainfall but how significant is this particular increase the second map will now give us some clarity that there is some significance see in the eastern part of the country now look at the western part of lake victoria for september october november it says there is a steady decline in rainfall during September, October, November. Then the significance also tell us that there is a clear signal, which is true. So if you try to look at this kind of thing, it means it is very good for policymakers. So to try to do a lot of intervention, what is bringing this kind of change and what is bringing the decrease in the rainfall over this region and what can be done. So these are some of the behaviors of rainfall during the season of March, April, and May, September, October, November, where it is decreasing and where it is increasing. Next. Yes, so what are the indicators? Because if there is an evidence, there, is the, there are causes, and what are some of the indicators? of the changing pattern of the climate. Number one indicators, increase frequency of drought and flood, very common these days. So that is a very clear indicator that the climate of this place is changing. Number two, emergency of new plants and plant species and disappearance of others. If you try to move across the country, you will find that there are some other plant species which used to exist. They are no longer there, but there are other new ones that have already come in place. So those are clear indicators of the climate change. Increased occurrence of thunderstorm. I believe you have observed nowadays, whenever rain is starting, it always characterized by a lot of storm. And these storms are sometimes very disastrous. It can hit, destroy, can kill. So these are some of the indicators that the climate of the place is also changing. Then emergency of new disease and increased frequency of the disease and pests for animals and plants. So just take a look at the animals we are keeping nowadays. If you recall those days, the animals which were being kept by our grandfathers, they were rarely vaccinated. But nowadays, there is always time after time vaccination of these animals. If you don't do that, animals will just die. So those are coming out as a result of the climate change. The melting ice of the Mount Renzori, then the warming of Kigezi Island. Next. Now. I bring you to the state of climate. The state of climate, we always do it every year. So this one, what I brought is, is the one we did for 2021. The 2022 is coming out very soon. So if you look at the 2021 uh, state of the climate, it tells us that the warming level, this one is over Uganda. The warming level in 2021 was approximately at 0 0.68 degrees centigrade above the long-term mean value, based on the climatological period 1981 to 2010. That is a reference point by which we can compare a given year with the normal climate of the place, meaning that 2021 
was more than the long-term mean, the long-term mean for the period 1981-2010. Observed frequency of the weather event during 2021 led to flooding and also affected so many livelihood across the country. The year 2021 was the third warmest on record because we did for many years, but it was observed that it was the third warmest after the 2019 and 2009 in that order. Meaning 2009 was the warmest so far in record based on our data set that we have analyzed over Uganda. 2009 was the warmest, followed by 2019, and the third one is 2021. The rate of increase of temperature during the period 1950 to 2021, because the data we picked from 1950 to 2021, looking at how the temperature had been behaving, was found to be at 0 0.23 degrees centigrade after every 10 years. So considering the best or the third one year alone, we can now see that the rate of temperature rise is slightly higher at a rate of 0 0.25 after every 10 years. So we can now see that the impact of this extreme weather event like drought, flood and heavy storm displaced over 222,000 930 passion from 36,404 household by August 2021. Next slide. Yes, now that is where our analysis is best. You can now see the red bars is telling us the years with the temperature above the normal state. While the blue bars are temperature which was below the normal state. Because our data, our analysis, we use data right from 1950s up to 2021. So you can now see the years backward around 1950, coming toward the 70s, the temperature were slightly colder and it was below the normal temperature based on the 1981-2010 uh, reference line. But as year progresses, we can now see the warming starts. So that is the kind of uh, uh, signal that we can explain that the temperature of Uganda is warming. So the national temperature assessment reveals that 2021 was the third warmest year on record since 1950 over Uganda after, 19, after 2019 and 20, 2009. The warming level of 2000, 2021 was approximately at 0 0.68 degrees higher than the long-term mean based on the climatological period of 81 2010. Next. Let's look at the trend. So if we look at the trend, that is how we have analyzed. You can now see from 1950 up to 20, temperature was going higher, higher every year. So that clear uh, line of the baseline, which is within the variation, if you see there is a cup there, at the same time, the temperature is varying, varying and it is also what increasing, but the direction of increase, it is going positively. So that is how you can now see that Uganda temperature is definitely increasing. And the increase is brought about by some of those factors that are listed. Of course, the population increase is also there where people are now giving a lot of pressure onto the natural resources because we are also encroaching on our forests. We are encroaching on the wetland 
And we are doing a lot of things. So in addition to the global uh, input onto these, uh, uh, the, 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 the greenhouse gases, we are also adding more. And that is the reason why we are seeing this kind of trend moving forward. Next. Yes, so let's go to the regional temperature. So if we look at the regional temperature, we pick the warmest year on record since 1950. That is the warmest year 2019. And we rank it with uh, 2021. Then we can see that the national, at the national level, that is Uganda, so rank 2019, rank three, that is 2021, rank number three. And warming rate after every 10 years for the period this. So the warming rate overall over Uganda is at 0 0.23. When we come to the central Uganda, of course, central Uganda, still the warmest year is 2019. While 2021 is the second warmest. Let us get that one very clear. 2021 is the third warmest for overall Uganda. But when we look at central, 2021 is the second warmest after 2019. What is the rate of increase? It's at 0 0.44 degrees after every 10 years. Eastern Uganda. The woman's year from 1950 still 2019. Then 2021 is the third, like overall Uganda. And the rate of increase after every 10 years is at 0 0.25 degrees. Then Karamoja subregion. Karamoja subregion, it is not 2019, it is 2009. If you can see now, the warming pattern of the country differs from one region to another because we did for all the regions, but we also did for the overall Uganda. So for Karamoja, it is not 2019, but it is 2009. And 2021 is the third warmest and the rate of increase is at 0 0.25. Then Northern Central, that is Northern Central part. That is the Choli Lango subregion. We can see 2019 is the warmest, then 2021 is the third warmest. Uh, Southwestern 2019 is the warmest, then 2021 is the fourth warmest year. Um, Western Uganda, uh, 2019 was the warmest, and 2021 was the fourth warmest. Then uh, West Nile sub-region, 2019 is the warmest, 2021 the fourth warmest. You can see the rate of their increase is at 0 0.54, 0 0.53, 0 0.7, 0 0.68. So if you look at the rate of this increase, we can now see that uh, Western and West Nile sub-region it shown a very high increase of temperature based on the period 1950 to 2021 at a rate of 0 0.7 and 0 0.68. So these are some of the areas which shows that temperature is going higher and higher. And the increase in temperature is not uniform. What brings about the non-uniformity? There are so many factors which play a role. The physical features we have around, the topographical features we have around, and also the land use, then the vegetation cover. So these are the kind of things which are in place. Next. Now, we come to the rainfall. If you look at the annual rainfall over Uganda, <clears throat> we can see there are two peaks during March, April, and May. 
then September, October, November. Now, we did analysis for those years which were very warm and 2021. So we picked 2019, 2021, and the long-term average. So the long-term average is the red line. So when we talk about the long-term average, it means that how our rainfall pattern displays itself over the country in a year. That should be the behaviors. Any deviation, it is above or below. So if you find it is going above the red, meaning rainfall has increased. If it is going below the red, it means rainfall has decreased. So we can see that the blue line is for 2019. The 2019, which registered the highest temperature on record by 2021, still was the year with the highest rainfall recorded. You can see the peak where it has peaked, and it was too much in September, October, November during the last uh, month of the year. Next. So, who do we blame for all this? All of us, in one way or the other, we, con we, are, we are contributing to the changes of the climate system. Therefore, it requires the participation of all countries in order to effectively address the issue of the climate change problem. However, developing countries share the biggest blame because they are the major emitter of this greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. So in that, developed countries should give financial assistance to developing countries so that they are in a position to cope and provide some mitigation measures to the impact of the climate change. Next. So in conclusion, <clears throat> we can say, Planning for climate change. Number one, what we decide right now will shape our vulnerability to the climate change tomorrow. Two, examining the possible impact of climate change provide information that can be used to inform the planning processes. This one is so good for government and development partners. We look at the impact. What are the impact of the climate change on the livelihood of the community? Then we will be in a position to come up with a good planning approach. The good decision we make now, in spite of the uncertainty of the climate change, is a very good uh, projection is a very good uh, plan for what we can do right now based on the projection which had already been given. Careful consideration of the range of projection impact combined with an analysis of resources, vulnerability to this impact will therefore provide prudent approach to planning. You know, like climate scientists, they do projection. Five years, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. So if you know the impact it brings with this kind of change, and you look at the projection, what is expected to come, then we will be in a position to adjust ourselves, knowing very well that by doing this kind of thing, we are going into this particular direction. So that is, I think, the last part of my presentation. Thank you so much for having this small moment with you people. Mr. Chair, I rest my case here. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Omoni, for a very educative talk uh, and helping us appreciate the climate variations and climate change and appreciate that it's a problem for us as well, because oftentimes when we hear it as a global uh, phenomenon, we think um, it's a bit far from us, but with this, we appreciate that climate change is with us and that we ought to wake up 
and plan and anticipate accordingly to make sure that we are not affected as we would. So at this point in time, um, I would like us to, if we have any questions, place them in the chat or raise your hand um, using the Zoom um, emoticons there. And then I'll choose you and you pick the question. But so far we have some questions that have come in the chat for Mr. George William. And one of them, someone asked if there is um, an impact on climate change in regard to natural trees, trees that are being cut down and being replaced by the foreign, foreign um, let me read the question as it is. The person said, I would like to understand the effect of place, replacing the natural forest cover with fast growing exotic tree species on climate change. So Mr. George, is there any impact on this or trees are all trees irrespective of whether they are natural or exotic? And there's another question. Maybe let me ask this. Pause that the three that are in and then you can respond to them at once. And then uh, someone asked uh, about if there is recent data concerning the floods. Your slide stopped at, I think, at 2010. And they were asking if there was any recent data on the, the trend concerning 20, 2010 to 2020. And there's a third question which is asking about the way that uh, these temperatures are recorded. You've been the temperature there have been varying temperatures in different regions and the temperature changes that we've seen over time. So how are these recorded and uh, who does this and what equipment is being used to report to record these temperatures? I think we can start, you can first respond to those as we wait for my questions to come in. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for asking those questions. <clears throat> Number one, uh, the leaves, the trees replacing those indigenous trees with the, the current trees, we find it is widespread all over. Well, uh, I, if we could be having like a, a forester here, I think we'll even give it better. But to the best of my knowledge and scientifically, you know, leaves, the trees, they have the leaves and the leaves, you look at the area coverage. Trees with the tiny leaves. Because you know, there is a what? Uh, this water vapor which is coming from the leaves due to transpiration. Now, in an area which is forested, if you find, you find there is a lot of relative humidity. That is water vapor in the atmosphere. Because some of these will be coming from the leaves. So if you find the leaves with a wider surface area, meaning it will give more of this water vapor in the atmosphere compared to these particular leaves, which are so tiny. Well, replacing those uh, indigenous trees, of course, uh, to some extent, it will reduce, it will adjust down the what? The weather pattern of the place, the change, it will slightly change it. Because those indigenous trees, they were really very helpful looking at their leaves, the, the area coverage, which is so white, and meaning that the region around that place, the relative humidity was higher compared to the current condition where the leaves, which had been replaced with as those tiny leaves. So in that, you will also get to know that the amount of rainfall which was received those days in that area, is quite different from nowadays. The difference will come in the amount. The amount of rainfall is less compared to those days. Two, there is high frequency of this kind of weather disasters, which is coming as a result of that. So for sure, changing three species can bring in some slight change in the temperature of the place or the climate of the place. Number two, they were talking of uh, our analysis was up to 2010. Do we have uh, data up to 2021? Yes, we have data after that, but this one, I did not bring it out 
for up to 2021, but we have all the data is in place. So we can generate it out and we will be in a position to see the frequency of current of this drought over Uganda. Number three, it was, uh, I have presented something like uh, the temperature rising over different part of the country. Do we have the data? How do we observe it? We have all the data. Uganda National Meteorological Authority is a government agency charged with the responsibility of installation of all weather monitoring station, monitoring the weather station and collecting all the data. So we have all the data. In fact, we have our data. There are some other station which was opened in, nine, in 18, 96, we have the data which is running up to now. So the others which were open 1910, 1940s, and the data are up to date up to now. So we have all those data for different parts of the country. Political station in different parts of the country. But in addition to that, also we have installed the ground monitoring station that is the manual. We have also installed the automated. Uh, weather monitoring station. Then we also back it up by some satellite monitoring, satellite uh, data set. So we have all those data set. We can get a data set for any given location of the country based on the various data set that we have in place. I think those are the question which was raised. Unless I left some, then I can be reminded and respond. Thank you. Thank you. I think you have addressed all the questions that have been raised so far. And um, there is a question where someone is asking how you and your team are mitigating climate change uh, through weather updates. Is there anything particularly that you're doing to try and mitigate this climate change? And how often do you do the weather updates or the, the change? climate variation updates if we have to go the whole cascade. And um, this one I believe is for Dr. Chimuli Ivan. Someone is asking if you could recap on the effects of lung health and source of surface ozone, how it's also measured and reduced in our setting. That's what we have for now. Maybe uh, Mr. George, you can okay. go ahead. And yes, then okay, Dr. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Uganda National Meteorological Authority gives projection on weather and climate at a different time scale. Uh, for the weather, we give six hourly projection, 30 minutes, one hour. Those 30 minutes, one hour are only applicable by aircraft. So we give those forecasts to the aircraft because they are the one who consume those kind of product. Then we have the daily forecast. We have also the weekly forecast. Then we have the 10 days forecast. Then we have the monthly forecast. We have the seasonal forecast. And the seasonal forecast is generated three times a year. For the season of March, April, and May, June, July, August, September, October, November. For March, April, and May is generated by the end of February. For June, July, August is generated by the end of May. For September, October, November is generated by end of August. That one will be giving you what will be the outlook for the expected rainfall in the next coming three months. On addition to that, we give that after every, at the end of uh, a given month, we give projection for the next month. And of course, you know, this three month, sometimes variation cannot be seen, but it will be checked by the monthly update because the monthly update gives more details of what is happening within the month. But month has 30 days, 28 days, also 31 days. There are many days. In between the month, there is also variation. Now, what have we done? We have broken the 30 days into 10 days. Then we give forecast for 10 days ahead. Like from day one to day 10 of the month, we give projection by the last, by the end of the previous month. Then by the eighth to the ninth of the month, we give projection for the 11th up to the 20th. Then by the 18th to the 19th, we give projection for uh, the 21st 
or to either the 30th or to the 31st or to the 28th of the month, depending on which day the month is ending. So by giving different time intervals of this kind of forecast product, we are in a position to check variation within the month, variation within the year, variation within the season. Then coming to the long-term projection on the climate, we project up to 50 years. So we give projection five years, 10 years, and 50 years. So those are the long-term climate projection we also give out. So those information are very useful for decision-making because you look at what is happening right now, then we look at what is expected to come next time. So decision maker can take that so that they can come up with appropriate mean of uh, either mitigation measures or adaptation processes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. George, for that elaborate answer. I, I think maybe to also help the person who asked the question, you could share where this information is shared. Is it on Twitter and maybe your Twitter handle so that people can follow it and be able to, to, to keep track of the updates as they are coming in. Okay, that information, it is uh, on our website also. That is uh, yonma, small letter, dot go, dot ug. So if you open that website, you will find those information, even the state of the climate for the different years from 2017, 2018, 20, uh, 2019, 2020, 2021, they are also there in that website. So it is yunma.go.ug. So when you open that link, you find a lot of those information that inside. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's very helpful. It's also for us as researchers, if we are interested in uh, research in this area and linking it to health, um, he has shown us where the information is and so we can make use of this. We are just a few minutes to the top of the hour and coming to the end of this session, I'll let Dr. Chimule answer the, the question that has given him so far and then we shall wrap up the session. Chair, Chair, I'm requesting you because I'm on my way to the field, allow me to proceed so that I can get out of the meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your deliberations. We, we release you. It's very fine. And we You're most welcome. Uh, yes, we are Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay, Patricia, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I think just a bit on ozone. So ozone is a gas that is composed of three atoms of oxygen, just like O2, this one is O3. Um, but in terms of health, it can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on where it is found. So where it is good is that part of ozone, which they call the stratosphere, the stratospheric oxygen, uh, where it occurs naturally in the upper atmosphere. So while it's very good because it forms a protective layer that shields us from the sun's harmful ultraviolet rays, However, when ozone is at ground level, uh, here now it is referred to as the troposphere or tros tropospheric ozone. And it is a very harmful air pollutant and uh, it's a big ingredient of smog. Uh, so for those of you who have seen uh, smog in certain places. So uh, 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 it's, it's basically a secondary pollutant. It's not a primary pollutant when it's at the ground level because it is formed by reactions between uh, the, the VOCs and the NOx uh, in the presence of sunlight. And uh, from a respiratory point of view, uh, it is very, very damaging. Um, I think there's a, there's a professor who described it and, and said that uh, when, 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 we are, when we are infecting swimming pools, uh, or rather disinfecting swimming pools, the gas ozone is actually used to disinfect swimming pools. So it basically it kills everything there. So if inhaled in just small concentrations, it is definitely going to irritate our lungs. And if uh, you have a respiratory condition, then you're definitely going to be even more sensitive to it. 
So in a way, it is toxic to the uh, to the to the respiratory tract, and therefore it's going to aggravate pre-existing respiratory condition both in children and in adults. Uh, and so that is how it, it's a long-term exposure can actually become uh, very dangerous. I submit. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chimoli, for that very clear and elaborate answer. I believe the one who has asked has been satisfied by that. And we certainly have appreciated um, the situation here in Uganda. And as a researcher, it has tickled me a bit to try and understand because we've seen studies done in um, settings where there's very drastic uh, weather changes. You move from winter to summer. And sometimes you think because of the equator and the fact that our temperature is more or less the same, the effects may be a bit different and what we see may be different. So uh, even as we have been availed all this information and the trend, it would still be important to see how exactly um, this comes into play with our health, given the uniqueness of our setting compared to the Western world where they have drastic weather changes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the top of the hour and the end of this dual session. We thank you very much for attending and for the very uh, stimulating questions that we've asked. Uh, we would like to release you now and keep encourage you to keep um, tuned in for the next communication that will come concerning the next dose. We have them monthly and we'll have another interesting topic to cover next month. I wish you all a good evening and we'll meet again in a month's time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Sasha. Thank you, Dr. Ivan. <laughs>